Welcome back. I hope you've had an enjoyable summer break. It seems to go by quicker every year. I think you'd agree with me. Uh, for those of you folks that remember when we had donuts and pastry and all those good things, they're out in the other hallway, so you can run out there and get it. More importantly, it's my sincere hope that you've all had a, a restful summer and a renewed, refreshed outlook for the 2005-2006 school year. Each year we have the opportunity to hire new staff in nearly every area, whether it be custodians, support staff, teachers, bus drivers, and administrators, and this year is no different. As our new people come on board, we not only have an opportunity, but an obligation to introduce them to and model the same welcoming atmosphere that has become a hallmark for the Hazlitt School District. I'm confident our new employees will embrace our culture and as that was established so many years ago here in Hazlitt. Before I begin my remarks today, I'd like to take a moment and recognize the Board of Education members present today. Kristen Belzer, Vice President. <laughs> Bev Levy, Bev Levy, Trustee. Chris Cody, Trustee. and Lori Barbieri, trustee. These dedicated folks have sacrificed their time and energies to make Hazlitt the special place it is today. I would also like to take this opportunity to introduce our hardworking custodial and grounds maintenance crews for all their efforts in preparing our buildings inside and out to ensure a smooth opening for our students tomorrow I will tell you, in the 15 years that I've been in this district, this is the 15th year our grounds and our buildings have not looked as good as this year. So thank you, folks. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank all the administrators, teachers, and support staff that participated in our hiring and interviewing process, as well as the negotiations this past summer, your hard work is very much appreciated. Uh, I made a point of embarrassing her last year, so I thought I'd do the same this year. I'd like to introduce my wife, Carolyn, who puts up with me and uh, is a terrific mother to our two children. So. As we move into the 2005-2006 school year, I'd like to share some of my observations and thoughts from my first year as a superintendent in Hazard Public Schools. First, we're finally wrapping up our construction projects throughout the district, and I wanted to make sure to thank each and every one of you for your patience and understanding in living through the interruptions and inconveniences over the past few years. I believe it's been a well thought out, fiscally managed, project and is something that we can look to as a point of pride. We've invested nearly $31 million since the start of construction back in, in 2001, so it's been a while. Our challenge will be to maintain our facilities without the help of bond dollars in the future. We're in the process right now of putting together a comprehensive facilities review to identify what additional, additional needs are out there for all of our buildings. We do not anticipate any new bond issues in the near future, so it's critical that we identify all potential major facility needs such as roofs, boilers, chillers, and other electrical and mechanical items. Our sinking fund dollars will play a critical role in meeting our additional facility needs. There are many challenges ahead of us as we enter into the 2005-2006 school year. So where do we stand as a district? While the governor has proposed $175 per student increase in foundation allowance, this is the first increase this district or any district in the state has received in the past three years. This increase in foundation will be bringing a little over $500,000 to our district. However, our projected losses in enrollment 
and, and uh, rising health and retirement costs will more than eat up any new dollars received at the state level. The state of Michigan's economic outlook is still very uncertain, which, which makes it quite difficult for districts, including Hazlitt, to plan for the future. Let's face it, the cost of doing business, and in this case running a school district, continues to escalate. The rising costs of energy for natural gas and electricity will also be a challenge for the upcoming year. Our 2001 bond issue has added around 75,000 square feet to existing buildings. We have new heating and cooling units in each one of our classrooms. This alone is projected to add approximately $50,000 to our overall costs that range somewhere between $500,000 to $550,000 per year. We're hoping to implement an energy savings initiative program to help conserve energy costs. You know as consumers that energy costs at the gas pump, natural gas to heat and cool our homes, as well as electricity and water use continues to rise. It's important that we be mindful of these costs and make sure that we are modeling and educating our children in a responsible manner. Turning the lights off, running our heating and cooling systems with our windows closed and turning off the water are all things I believe we practice in our homes and we must be vigilant to do the same when we come to work. Our parents were right, turn the darn lights off. This past year, we began to examine more closely the expenditures throughout the districts. One of the ways we believe we can curtail costs is to partner with other school districts to offset some of our expenses. This year, we will be sending our bus maintenance to the Okemos Public Schools, where they will service our buses and school vehicles. We have also been aggressive in consolidating bus runs with the Okemos Schools with regards to our Career Center bus runs. We will now pick up their students or vice versa and cut down on transportation costs. Because we are willing to engage in partnerships, the transportation costs will be waived for the next couple of years through a grant from the state of Michigan. Additionally, we've been working with Lansing Community College and the Ingham Intermediate School District on trying to establish satellite programs with local districts to provide additional educational experiences for our students. This year, Hazlitt High School will host a stage technology program where students from other districts will attend our schools for half day, for one half day to be educated in an area they would otherwise not have access to. These are examples of small steps, but we ultimately, ultimately want to expand partnerships in all areas. I do see it as a necessity if we want to remain competitive and continue to be able to offer the same kinds of quality programs in the future. We must be creative. With no child left behind mandates, each state issues an adequate yearly progress report for each district. I'm pleased to report that Ralia, Murphy, the middle school, and the high school all made AYP this year. This clearly is a validation of the staff's hard work and dedication to our students. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the exceptional work of our Wilkshire staff that lay a solid foundation for our young children before they move on to the 2-5 buildings. I'd also like to congratulate Meridian High School staff and their efforts to provide an alternative education and can boast the largest graduating class in the school and the history of their program in 2005. I also believe our district mapping project has paid dividends in aligning our curriculum to the state benchmarks and the newly developed grade level content expectations have provided our district a roadmap for the future. All of our schools score well above the state average. Just another indicator of what a terrific job you are all doing. My first teaching position was 30 years ago. Yeah, I'm that old. I remember even back then the emphasis on standardized test scores and the comparison of kids. I remember the questions that were generated, such as the comparison of individual students and the issue of fairness to kids, to families, and to school districts. MEEP was introduced in around the late 70s, and the message clearly was sent to all students that all students would now be judged by a singular instrument as to whether they were uh, achieving at grade level standards. Guess what? Things have not changed. 
an emphasis continues to be placed on testing. Whether we agree with standardized testing or disagree, we cannot ignore the implications for poor testing results. The fairness of this testing will continue to be debated for years and years. The reality is that it's here to stay and not one of us sitting here will outlast standardized testing and comparisons of students and their districts. All of us here today want the best possible education for our children. Expecti expectations will continue to rise just as they've continu continued to rise since the inception of public education. I'm confident as a school district we will continue to help our students excel and challenge them to meet these high expectations. Our school district and community, community continues to enjoy a reputation as a great place to raise and educate our children. I believe the credit for this reputation belongs to you and those that have served before you. Each individual in this room contributes to the success of this reputation. As representatives of the Hazlitt District, there's an expectation that we will adhere to certain standards in the way we do our jobs and how we interact with students, their parents, our colleagues, and the greater community. In short, we are here in no small measure to set a great example. As I said to you earlier, the summer has flown by. I also think that when this time rolls around, there's a strong desire among most of us to establish a routine. While routine may sound dull, there is nothing dull about what each and every one of you accomplish each day. You're the ones who bring our students safely to school, make sure they have a nutritious lunch, rekindle the fire for knowledge in their brains, teach them new skills, keep their parents informed, and tend our school grounds and buildings. Your skills, your creativity, your professionalism, and your enthusiasm are what drive the Hazlitt School District, making it an invigorating, challenging, and pleasant place for our students and everyone else who comes into contact with our school system. In other words, everything that you do here matters. It really matters. Thank you again for all of your support, and I'd like to wish each and every one of you the best for the upcoming 2005-2006 school year. I've been in Hazlitt since my kids were in sixth grade, so I have twins that are now in college. My son's at Grand Valley, played for Coach McIntosh, and my daughter Kristen's at Western, which we just dropped her off yesterday. So don't hold that against me that you had my kids in your class and they weren't very good and so forth. <laughs> I came to Hazlitt when my kids were in sixth grade and I was kind of nominated as the basketball coach. I was in transition, our house wasn't built yet. But it was really amazing to me, Jeff Joy, many of you know Jeff Joy, him and I and Brett Beam were the coaches of this basketball. I had no experience coaching basketball. I was kind of a fitness guy, but they said, well, do you know anything about basketball? I said, absolutely not. Then you're hired. We're going to put you in as a coach. And then the parents were very pleasant to me and everything else, and that was kind of my indoctrination to, into Hazlitt. And one last thing before we get started, I was kind of, you know, everybody's asking about my son. He's on golf scholarship at Grand Valley. You know, how's Matt doing? Well, you know, golf's not doing real great. I have a little mental problem with the golf team, but you know what? He did great in school. And some of you may have Matt. He kind of struggled in school, wasn't really interested. Only Coach McIntosh would tell you, the only thing he's interested in is playing golf. Him and Sean would go out and play golf all the time. But he did really well in school last year. So I'm kind of really excited about his academics and where they're going. And he was actually asking me some different things about school. So whatever impression you guys have had over some of these kids, and sometimes you don't always know that you had the impact, well, the impact I'm seeing now. So I just want to salute many of you that had some of these kids in school that you sometimes go, are they, are they really going to make a difference? Is, is he going to play on the Pro Tour? Oh, no. He's not going to play on the Pro Tour. He's figuring that out, and he has to go do some other things. So anyway, one other thing. You all have in your lives, you kind of connect the dots. And it's interesting that when I was in graduate school, I worked at Frito-Lay delivering potato chips. And before that, I was at Butternut Bread delivering white bread. And so when you think you talk about this stuff, kind of I connected the dots along the way. And then I got into this field. So 
If you do have questions about munchos and funyuns later, I'll ask, answer some of those questions. But the point is, we all have those dots. And I really salute some of the folks in here, you know, 25, 30 years. That's, a, that's amazing, the impact you have over people. And this is really what we're here today about, is what Todd was saying, the power of feeling your best. And when I sat down with Sharon and I sat down with, you know, Troy got me involved in this. And, you know, what do you really want to talk about? Well, I want to talk about feeling your best. Now, everybody in this room has their own understanding of what that may feel. So when you walk out of here today, I'm not asking you to have the organic oatmeal that you had for breakfast this morning with soy milk and some almonds and some organic raisins. How many of you tried that? Well, if you didn't, you can raise your hand anyway. But the point of it is, you don't necessarily need to go there. The point is that you might start and make some small changes, like Todd was saying. And that's really my mission today, is to kind of talk about that, of feeling your best. Because it's amazing, and I've done this for a long time, that people really don't understand how they could feel. And we all want to feel good. There's no doubt about it. Everybody that I deal with each and every day, people want to feel good, and they think it's too much work. And... Mike was saying earlier, it talks about getting in habits and getting into random acts that you're doing. And I'm going to show you some of that stuff today. So as we get going, and we'll end, and I'll ask a few questions. And then if you need to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me through email and things like that. And I'd be happy to talk with you over time on some of those issues. Okay? I'm just going to start out at the very beginning. I'm going to kind of paint an ugly picture here at the beginning because where have we gone wrong in the United States? Or have we gone wrong? Well, just I'm going to throw some statistics out. In 1982, we had obesity levels of 11%. In 2004, we have a 24 obesity level. We basically doubled our obesity level in the last 20 years. And you're thinking, well, genetics have changed. Come on, wake up. There's no way genetics have changed. The big change that we see in our environment from obesity standpoint from dementia to diabetes, you name it, goes all the way down the spectrum, is this thing called the toxic food environment. We all are in it. You know, I was really, I was really excited. When I first met Todd, I'm thinking, you know, food service guy, I'm kind of getting into his little territory, talking about oatmeal. He's actually embracing making some small changes in how to replace some of these things for the kids and for the faculty, and that's really the big change we've seen. Everywhere you go, from, the, from restaurants to the driving uh, fast food, gas stations, terminals, you name it, you see it. And the last thing, we'll talk about information and dieting. The last one is lack of movement. We all know that. I had a meeting yesterday with the Michigan Surgeon General, and we were talking about how do we get kids moving more regularly. That's a hard thing to do, because they're sitting at the computers and on and on and on. And you guys are the role models. So if you're saying, okay, let's get up and do a, a posture break, which we're going to do right now. So everybody right now, stand up, because you're tired of sitting, right? I want you to bring your toes and your heels together. And then I want you to bend your knees just a little bit, and I want you to squeeze your inner thighs together. Okay? Not your knees, but your inner thighs. Then I want you to take the gluteus maximus, squeeze a coin between the gluteus maximus. <laughs> then I want you to take your navel, and again, ladies, you know about this. It's called the get skinny muscles. Okay? Pull the navel up and in, and guys too. Chest is up, shoulders are down. That's your posture right there. That's a habit. You can do this each and every day. So right now, you are in a virtually form of strength training, okay? Don't forget to breathe. Breathe. Okay? <laughs> All right, now sit back down, okay? I think that was funny. It's good. This is the second thing I just want to mention a little bit. In our society, do we believe we're an over-medicated society? Absolutely. Our technology in the United States is unbelievable from a medical standpoint. We have great technology from pharmaceuticals to physicians to research, you name it, we have it. But if you look at these medications, this is the top 20 in 2004, so this is updated until the end of 2005, of what we're seeing in billions of dollars. This is billions of dollars. It's not millions of dollars. Billions of dollars. And if you think that your health care is going to be something that the school system is going to be paying for down the road, I want to tell you something different, because the wellness revolution is coming very quickly. You're going to be paying for insurance down the road just like you do car insurance. Higher risk, higher payment. 
If you look at the top two here, Lipitor and Zocor, which are statin drugs, they lower cholesterol levels, Lipitor is $115 per month. So when you're looking at this thing right now, that's over $12 billion spent on two medications that lower cholesterol. And the point of it is today, I'm going to show you some stuff that you can do, and I, I claim this every time. 15 years of doing this seminar, I've never had one person that has lowered their cholesterol level through food. That's simple. But many of you are not willing to do that, and that's okay. You know, and you don't want to go back to your physician. I always saw this goofy fitness guy in the open day of hazardous schools, and he was all talking about getting off my medication. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how powerful it is. How many of you have arthritis in this room or blood pressure issues and things? I'm going to throw a couple of simple things to you, and that's a choice you have. Because none of us, when you really look at the human body itself, there's really five stages of disease, and the first one is malnutrition. We're not feeding the body correctly, and the second stage of any disease is called malabsorption. You eat foods, but they're not digested and assimilated in the system, so you can't be healthy. That's really the side effect of most medications, that it doesn't allow you to have optimal absorption of foods. Is there a need for so many of these medications? Absolutely. Do you know the fastest growing medications right now in the United States are? Anybody know? The fastest growing. How about these things called acid reflux medications? We've all seen it. You've seen the guy, the good looking guy comes out with a purple pill. You've seen that? How do you guys know what the purple pill is? Because the advertising is so powerful. Nexium, Prevacet, these are all acid reflux medications. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more. And then when you get into some of these other medications, such as, ladies, you know what this number 20 is? Fosamax, which helps for bone health. Wall Street Journal on last Thursday talked about osteoporosis and that if people take, me, me, uh, females take Fosamax, you're going to become much healthier. Well, they didn't tell you the side effects of Fosamax is acid reflux. Wow. And then if you have acid reflux with Fosamax, you're not going to get the optimal absorption anyway. So if you do consume calcium and magnesium, you're still not going to get it. And i just like to point this out at the very beginning because one of the things I want you to understand is how powerful the human body is. If I put everybody's hand up in the air, put your hand up in the air, and you take a knife and you cut your hand, what will happen in two days? It will heal it, start healing itself. You'll get a scab on there. You guys thought we were going to do something cool, didn't you? But it's really true, the body will heal itself. So if you don't think it will heal itself, you're dreaming, because it will. So wherever you're at in your health, and you want to make a few small changes, it's amazing what will happen in the human body. But just I want to understand, many of these are, and what I see each and every day at the Michigan Athletic Club and some of the other clubs that I consult with, is that people are in their 50s, and they're on five or six medications. How does that start? One leads to another, one leads to another. They're all sister drugs. So now you're all gloomed and doomed, and no, you're not. I just want to show you that you do have options. And so when I talk about fish oil in a little while, you're going to go, well, I'm not interested in that fish oil. You might want to be. And this is what we're here for today. It's feeling good. So when you look at the top here, optimal health and performance, what does that mean? Does that mean you have to have a beautiful body? Absolutely not. I'm talking about feeling better when you get up in the morning, when you move, when you have posture during the work, is my back sore at the end of my day, things like that. And this is the bottom of the pyramid. So if you really want to feel a little bit better, I'm not going to tell you to drink, not drink coffee anymore. I'm just saying instead of having seven cups of coffee a day, you might have three. Okay? Nutrition we'll talk about and moving the body, we'll get you talking, we'll do that in a second when we talk about posture. All right, I want you to take the back of your hand out. Everybody got a pen? And if you don't have, don't worry about it. But if you do have a pen, take out your hand out and flip it over to the back. I want just pure white space. On the back of the handout, something really wild we're going to do, we're going to draw a big circle. And inside the circle, we're going to draw a smaller circle, and that's going to be the cell membrane on the outside and the nucleus on the middle. And then I want you to draw a couple squiggly lightning bolts on the side. And that's called the myochondria. And you're thinking, what the heck is this going to talk about? Well, the point of this is, Everything occurs at the cell level. When you talk about weight loss, many people are concerned about weight loss. It's only a $60 billion industry, $60 billion. And health all occurs at the cell level. What goes in and out of the cell makes you healthy. So the whole presentation I'm going to talk about is really based at the cell level. Now you're thinking, well, what are these squiggly lines, any physiology, anatomy, probably a lot of science people out here. The myochondria really is the metabolic component of the body. 
people say all the time, as I get older, I'm going to be 48 in the fall, people say all the time, is your metabolic slow down? Sure. It doesn't have to slow down that much because what feeds the mitochondria are some of these good fats I'll talk about in a second. So if you want to increase your metabolic rate as you age, you feed the mitochondria correctly. And then when you talk about disease itself, the third stage of any disease is the mitochondria starts to break down and get, doesn't perform like it should. Cancer, we know right now, is basic mitochondria breakdown. People are going, oh my gosh, how can we, we do know this, but how do we stop it? So again, I'm not saying today we're going to eat, or oh, everybody's really excited to have some kale. You guys like eating kale? Okay. Maybe yes, maybe no, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about making the cell a little healthier, just a little healthier. All right, so what are your goals here? Well, one of your goals is you want a job security, so you had to come today, right? You didn't have a choice. But when I talk to folks, I want you to think about it. If you look at getting the cell healthy first, the weight takes over, the energy becomes better, that just naturally occurs. That just naturally happens. So every weight loss program that I see in the country right now, the first goal is losing weight. I see it every day. Why do people join the MAC or any other club across the country? Because most people want to lose weight. So I'll show you a little bit about that. But you really want to look at, gosh, do I really feel good? Do I feel good? Do I have energy every day? Some days we do, some days we don't. And we talk about nutrients. Sharon was asking earlier, well, and many of you are thinking this, is this table healthy or unhealthy? Is that table healthy or unhealthy? These are macronutrients, and I'm going to kind of go through this for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll break it up and you'll see what we're doing here. This is carbohydrates right here. And the reason I started doing this seminar is because people don't have a clue what we're talking about with carbohydrates. Then we have proteins next to me, and the other side we have fats. These are called macronutrients. So I'm going to start with carbohydrates here. And some of you in this room right now, how many of you, how many of you did eat oatmeal? Predominantly your breakfast was carbohydrates, some protein, and some fat. It was relatively balanced. So the sticky buns we were talking about earlier, that many of you are, gosh, I wish I had sticky buns because I was really looking first day. That would have been all carbohydrates, and your energy is going to go up and down. So when we talk about carbohydrates, it is your main energy source of the body. The main benefit, though, when you're looking at carbohydrates, is vitamins, minerals, fiber, energy. This is really where the energy occurs in the human body, right here. And one thing I want you to understand of carbohydrates, it's the only fuel the body can actually simulate through the brain. You need at least 100 grams a day just to fuel the brain. So some of these diets out there that do not do this, you will not have the energy for the brain. So when you think about carbohydrates, what are they? Here they are. You guys have a target in the back of your handout, the big circle. It's in black and white. Why don't you flip to that real quick? This line right here, these are all carbohydrates up here. The red area is foods that have very, very little fiber, vitamins. There's not a lot of benefits of consuming those. And as the foods get closer to the green area or the center, the healthier they become. Lots of antioxidants, fiber, minerals, you name it, better energy. On the outside is the unhealthy carbohydrates. So if you look at the continuum here on the red area over to the other side, if I ask everybody in this room what kind of breakfast cereal to eat, you say, well, I eat oatmeal. Is it maple and brown sugar oatmeal? Is it quick oats? Is it regular oats? You know, many of you are probably consuming organic steel-cut oats, right? Probably not. So if I said tomorrow we're going to go from Captain Crunch cereal, kids, because I tell you, I have kids, and I used to, my daughter Kristen used to drive me crazy. We're going to go from Captain Crunch cereal to steel-cut oats. What's going to happen in your household? You're going to have some huge problems. If Todd comes back in the next couple weeks and he starts serving organic oatmeal to the students here and the faculty, what's going to happen? He's probably going to be in trouble. So the point of this is you're not going from one end all the way to the other and then skip of the beat here. You might want to transition along the way and develop these habits, which Mr. Duda said earlier, you're developing a habit, a pattern that you're developing over time. So if your daily thing is to have no water, sticky bun, four cups of coffee, you're probably not going to get the energy that you want throughout the day. And then maybe you transition away. I was at a seminar last week, and one of the guys comes up to me later, and he says, you know, I drink nine Mountain Dews a day. 
and then I go into my day. Basically, he drinks nine Mountain Dews before no noon. And you're thinking, wow, crazy? True. So what am I going to tell that guy? Say, you know what? I think you should do green tea. <laughs> Seriously. And have some organic oatmeal for breakfast. It's not going to work. It's got to say, you know, I said to him, let's do the six Mountain Dews a day and replace that with a little water. He said, okay, I can do that. <laughs> okay, here you go. Six months from now, maybe we're down to three Mountain Dews. That's the point. The point is, you, once you get stuck in this hole, you don't have to be there forever, and you don't have to make leaps and bounds to get where you want to be. Now, when you think of carbohydrates themselves, are carbohydrates good or bad? If I got in most people's brain in here today, many of you say, you know what, carbohydrates make me fat. Because why would Krispy Kreme donuts have a low-carb donut? Is that the stupidest thing you've ever heard? I'm going to go to Krispy Kreme and I'm going to get a low-carb donut. No, you want the biggest, drooiest Krispy Kreme you're going to get because that's why you're there. And I hear that all the time. Well, it's low fat or if it's whatever you want, make it whatever you want. But don't think that just because it's a low carb, and since when do fruits and vegetables ever make you fat? True story. I was in Kroger's in, in Okemos about a year ago. I'm wheeling down my cart. I do most of the shopping in my household, and I got bananas in my cart. One of the Mac members comes up to me, and she says, do you eat bananas? Well, of course I eat bananas. They're in my cart. But anyway, I do eat bananas. And I said, you know what? It's nature's perfect food. It's beautifully wrapped. It has really high in potassium, good fiber, good minerals in it. It's very healthy for you. She goes, wow, do you know those are high glycemic and can cause your blood glucose to go? I'm going, what? It's a banana. Since when has a banana or a blueberry ever made you fat? If I gave everybody in this room an orange or a banana, how many oranges or bananas would you eat? One. If I gave everybody in this room a Tom's Mom cookie, how many would you eat? <laughs> I know me. I'd eat six or seven of them. I don't buy fat-free Fig Newtons anymore because there's 24 in a package, and I will eat the whole package. And then Lay's chips, remember Frito-Lay guy? They came out with a new healthy version of baked Lay's. How many of you remember baked Lay's when it first came out? Wow, it's the greatest invention ever. No oil baked and everything else. I'd eat the whole bag. The point of this is, is you're looking at understanding what they are. If you want a healthier potato chip, you can get it, better oils. I have microwave popcorn, very unhealthy. I have a microwave popcorn that's very healthy. I have snack oil cookies, fish, wheat thins, very unhealthy, and I have crackers that are today, all the crackers you had today were made with really good quality oils. Very good for you. I have Jif peanut butter over here, and I'll talk about it in a second. And then I ha we had today natural soft serve peanut butter that we got for Foods for a Living. It's just soft serve. Those are easy changes to make. So again, I'm not saying not to have, and this is the thing I used to do with my son, Matt. He loves pizza. Red Baron deep dish pizza versus Amy's organic pizza. And now he's in college. It's amazing. He calls me yesterday from Grand Valley. He's shopping. Get the, can you imagine when your kids go to college, now they're, in a, now they're shopping? It was just like, he goes, Dad, what about this, 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 and this? I go, well, you know, this is, they pay attention. They know what's going on. My daughter, Kristen, last year in her dorm was really, it was kind of cool. It made me really feel good. But she says to me, you know, Dad, a lot of the girls really don't understand how to eat. I said, well, Kristen, you've been, you grew up with Ewell Gibbon. <laughs> so when you say, Kristen, you know, Canola mayonnaise to these girls, they don't know what canola mayonnaise is. It's completely foreign to them. But do you know that you can have a better choice of the mayonnaise? That's the point today. We're going to get into some of that. But I think carbohydrates has really come up with a bad rap. And if you look at carbohydrates themselves, we have been bombarded forever with the South Beach diet, the Atkins diet. What's the problem with that? You're taking fruits and vegetables and whole grains out of the system. And one of the medications I said earlier is your antidepressants. Zoloft, you name it, get into all those depression medications. And one of the things we have to understand, the B-complex vitamins from grains, such as yams and rice and the oatmeal you had today, that helps serotonin levels, helps to make you feel better. So when I train mostly women, males too, 
but they come in and they're depressed, one of the things I say right now, what, bless you, what kind of B-complex vitamins are you consuming? They go, I, I'm just on this Atkins side that takes these out of my system. Well, what, why are you on that? They said, well, it's helped me lose weight. Well, do you know what helps you lose weight? Because every carbohydrate in the system holds four moles of water. You're thinking, okay, well, what's that got to do with it? Well, you only hold about 500 grams a day, so if you get rid of those carbohydrates, you lose the water weight in a second. That's why the science behind it. You're thinking, well, that's okay. Well, then I'm taking fruits and vegetables, antioxidants, all that stuff out of my system. Then you start looking at what happens in the body. It becomes very acidic, which I'll talk about in a minute. You have a pH level in the body. And this is why we're getting an acid reflux and all the different problems. On one side, you have alkalinity. On the other side, you have acid. In the center is a balance. You're thinking, what does that got to do with anything? Well, as your body moves more into acid levels, too much protein, too much processed carbohydrates, too much Mountain Dews, your body becomes very acidic. To balance that acidic level, the body has to use calcium and magnesium to buffer those. So now you lose bone. And then, since you're losing water, what happens to you? You get constipated. So now I'm losing bone, I'm constipated, I don't have any vitamins and minerals in my body, I feel like crap because I don't have any serotonin in my body, but you know what? I'm losing weight. <laughs> I'm happy, right? Really, are you happy? I'd rather have a few more pounds in my body, feel better, have regular bowel movements, and not lose my bone. It's so funny, you know, at the MAC, I've been there forever, you know, Derek will tell you he's been there a long time, comes back, I'm loved to have, this guy's an awesome guy. But I come back and I got my meal patterning book, which I wrote in 2000, I've been doing the seminar, I do the seminar all over the country now. And I have people right behind me going, yeah, this Atkins book is great, I'm losing the weight, I'm going, what is that? Then I go to my family, two Christmases ago, and I see the Atkins book laying on the table. I'm in Saginaw. My mom, when she got there, she goes, you better put that book away. Because they don't understand this whole, they don't understand it. The carbohydrates don't make you fat. And everybody in this room wants to have their blood glucose level look like this on the left, not like this over here. And you can say, well, yeah, I want to be over here. No, you don't, because at the bottom level, you want to go to sleep. And many of you may be right there right now. And it goes back up and back down. That's one of the reasons why we consume too much caffeine. That's why we consume too much processed carbohydrates, because it jacks our blood glucose level up. How many of you are for Thanksgiving dinner? 3,000 calories in your first go-around. The next go-around is about 2,000. <laughs> so about average typical Thanksgiving, 5,000 calories. Do you know that? So after you've taken your nap, the lions are boring. They're losing again. I had Joey Harrington on WGR yesterday. I'm just going, this is not the right guy. Anyway, when you get up from your nap, what do you want to do? And you're not going to want to eat more kale or broccoli. Stuffing, mashed potatoes, pumpkin pie. I've just consumed 3,000 calories. How can I be hungry? It's because of this right here. Your blood glucose goes up. You go back down. You have no other choice right there. It's called the carbohydrate black hole to eat foods that are processed or take a nap. So keep that in mind. We all get there. If you've never been there before, anybody not been in the carbohydrate black hole? Remember I said the Fig Newtons? I'll start out with six, and then I go, oh, gosh, I have to have six more. I'm getting in the carbohydrate black hole. You can't get out of it. And people say all the time, I'm so mentally weak, I have no willpower. No. Nope. It's physiological. Okay? You can blame it on this right here. So the next time you eat four pieces of pizza and a couple of beers and you come back down and you have another four pieces of pizza, you can blame it right here. But understand that you don't want to be here all the time. And then we talk about proteins. I'm over here now. These are proteins right here. Everybody knows proteins are good for you, but it's amazing to me, I will look at, and again, I'm gonna pick on the gales a little bit more. They'll pick up an energy bar, protein bar. And they'll say, you know, when we sell these at different, we used to sell these at different clubs, it says 30 grams of protein. I see it at the Mac every day. They'll come in and then we have this organic whole food bar. One has less carbs, which is the detour bar, more protein, that's the bar to pick. Absolutely not, it's the worst ingredients, this is much healthier for you. So just because it has protein does not mean it's healthy for you. If you have too much protein, the side effect basically, your body becomes, back to our pH level in our body, becomes more acidic. Ladies, if you have too much protein, you will lose bone. We know that. 
guys, we only need about a half a gram per pound of body weight. So if you're 200 pounds, you only need 100 grams a day. You don't need more than that. In our society, we think proteins make us leaner. You need proteins to help stabilize your blood glucose level, but you don't need too many. All right, so when you look at proteins we're looking at right now, people say, well, the first thing you got at the top there is soy-based foods. Are you kidding me? You want me to eat soy foods? How many of you consume soy? One of the easiest ways today, you had soy today if you had that oatmeal because we had soy milk in there. It's a plant-based protein. Very easy to consume, very healthy for you. Soy milk is one easy thing to do if you don't, you've never tried it. That's what we had. That oatmeal you had today was not cooked. Oh, I'm really planting the, the nail in it now. Uncooked soy, organic oatmeal, raisins, you name it, that's what was in your deal today. In balance, soy is very healthy for you. You know, I always always thought that the only soy that you consume would be tofu. I'm not a real fan of tofu. You have soy nuts, soy cheese, and you have soy protein powder. The easiest thing to do is soy milk. One of the things I'll mention real quickly, we need to look at getting into more organic protein. Now you're saying, well, you didn't say anything about protein. Well, maybe you didn't think this at all, but in, I didn't say anything about fruits and vegetables being organic. The problem with our meats right now, our dairy, is we're using antibiotics in animals. Well, what's the problem with antibiotics? Well, when you take an antibiotic, just the science behind it, basically what it does is tries to heal the body. Well, one of the things it does is it kills enzymes. So we're seeing a lot of acid reflux problems in the United States. And we've heard about acidophilus. You only have about a trillion enzymes in the stomach. If you're doing milk products so they have antibiotics in them, it will kill the enzymes. So the first thing I talk to people about that have acid reflux problems, you get them on some kind of organic dairy or organic meats because it keeps it natural. We've all heard of yogurt has enzymes in it and so forth. So this is a no-brainer. Get your milk, Kroger's, Meyers, L&L, you name it, get the organic. The price has drastically come down, so it's not a huge issue from a price standpoint, with no antibiotics. Then Sean Rutherford was over at my house last, oh, a couple years ago, and he said, Mr. Johnson, what does organic milk taste like? What do you think it tastes like? It just tastes like milk. But think, people think that since it's organic, again, we didn't ever have to worry about this 20, 30 years ago, but now we do. The same thing with eggs. Free range, that means that chickens are running around, eggs is what you want to buy. You can get these everywhere now. Prices have drastically reduced. These used to be over $4.50 a dozen. Now they're about $2.50 a dozen. So again, or if you know a local farmer, which there's some in this area, I would highly recommend consuming these eggs as source and make sure you do one to two yolks a day because the yolks are healthy from the free range egg. Okay? These are things that people don't talk about. And then you get into protein powders and I got everything else, tuna. The only thing I want to mention on tuna is that ladies, you do not want to consume tuna, especially if you're pregnant. If you're not pregnant, you want to make sure you're only consuming one to two servings a week because of the high mercury content. And the Salmon we're seeing now is mostly farm-raised, and we'll get into that in a second. Okay? The last thing I want to mention, and I have dairy up here and so forth, many people, including many of your students, become allergic to milk products. So whether it's milk, or maybe even allergic to soy. So if, and my daughter is a perfect example of this. She had asthma. She was allergic to milk products. So we cut her milk drastically down. She loved cheese and she didn't have the asthma anymore. First thing she went to the doctor, they wanted to give her an inhaler. I'm thinking, wow, you know, let's talk about this before we're doing this. My son, Matt, had severe acne this last year. He doesn't want to take his shirt off. I don't blame him, he's 19 years old, he's got a new girlfriend, he's never had a girlfriend in his life. Now he's got this girlfriend, and he doesn't want to take his shirt off. And so the first thing he goes to the physician, and the next thing I want to do is give him some kind of acne medication. I look on the, the side effects, and I get this booklet back, the first side effect is suicide. So what's the highest level of suicide in the United States? Teenage male. And now I'm going to give this because it's going to help his acne. So now you look at risk reward, and the next thing I know, Matt, you've got to clean up your diet. He cleans up his diet, and his acne gets better. My daughter cleans up her diet, her asthma gets better. We don't talk about this stuff, but we need to. So as representatives of sometimes your kids, and your students, you got to talk a little bit about this. And so, and this gets into a funny story. I thought, you know what, Kristen, do you know, and she doesn't know this, but I said, you know what, let's try some different alternatives. So I go to the grocery store, 
And I'm looking around, and I go to the health food store, and I find goat's milk, goat's cheese, goat's yogurt, whatever. Anybody had goat's milk? Not a lot of hands, right? What's the science behind this? Because the protein molecule in goats is much smaller than milk or soy, so it's an option for her. So I'm going to try it. So I put it in the refrigerator, sitting there. I watch her come home. I try it, and I go, this is the nastiest thing in the world. I'm kind of like a shark. I can eat anything if I think it's good for me. She comes home, she drinks, pours the milk, and her and one of her girlfriends is over, and the next thing you know, she goes, she drinks it. I'm looking over the couch, and she's, oh my gosh, this is awful. And she looks at me, and she goes, Dad, is this milk rotten? I said, Kristen, no, it's not rotten milk, it's goat's milk. She goes, you're such a freak. <laughs> so I kind of failed in that deal. But the point of it is I wanted to educate her about it, and you have lots of options. You have oat milk, almond milk, goat's milk, which I would highly recommend, and some other milks in here if the kids are allergic to some of these things, which many people are. Okay? And the last story I want to talk about is protein powders. You guys are going to have smoothies in a little bit. Many of you are very challenged throughout the day. I know exactly what you're doing. I see personal training clients one after another. I don't have time to eat. And one of the things I want you to highly, highly recommend, you want to try to eat frequent small meals if you can. So during the day, you're not going to have time to eat a meal, but maybe you can pull out a smoothie and drink that, okay? So I'm talking to one of the, my clients, 76-year-old Lou Brandt, at the time, CEO of John Henry Company. He says, you know, I'm going to have better energy throughout the day. And if you ever, anybody knows Lou Brandt, he's a very dynamic older guy, and he's just full of it. So I said, okay, let's make up a smoothie. So again, and this is the protein powder you guys have today is whey. You have whey or soy. So I said, you know, take some soy, a banana, frozen fruit, and some good fats, mix it all together. Okay, great. Comes back to me the next couple days later. He says to me, that was the nastiest smoothie I've ever tasted in my life. I said, what do you mean? Tell me what you did. I took three cups of water, three cups of protein powder. I said, Lou, three scoops of protein powder, Lou. They're one ounce. So instead of putting in three ounces of protein powder, he put 24 ounces in. I said, Lou, did you try to blend it up? He goes, yeah, the blender was dying. <laughs> and worst of all, I said, Lou, did you try to drink it? He goes, yeah, I just barely get, get a little down. I almost choked to death on it. So the point of this is you want to make it your own way. If you want to doctor it up a little bit, you can. But keep in mind, if you're not making it and it doesn't taste good, then you're doing probably something wrong. It doesn't have to taste bad to be good for you. Okay? All right, we're moving into the last one here. This is my favorite part of talking about nutrition, because fat is the most misunderstood part of nutrition. And when you look at fat grams, I think over the years, we're always afraid of eating fat. Fat's going to make us fat. Just the opposite. Remember the cell I drew earlier? The cell membrane is controlled by what fat you put in it. The zigzag, the myochondria, is controlled of what you feed it. So keep in mind, fat is healthy. Okay. Now look at this right here. The top, the body's healing nutrient. I want you to look at fats like you've never looked at before. This is your body's healing nutrient. If you don't get anything out of this seminar today that you might want to drink more water and eat more frequently throughout the day, this is the most important right here. This is the my medicine every day, all my clients' medicine. This is something you can do, and it's very simple to do. And when you eat fat, are you happy or are you sad? You're happy, right? Why do they put fat in products? Just because they want to? No, because they know it satisfies people. So when you consume fat in the morning, you guys had fat on your oatmeal today. I put some almonds in it. It has fat in it. That will help stabilize your blood glucose every day. And this is the power right here. If you have inflammation, which could be arthritis, it could be low-grade, Vioxx, anybody see the, the lawsuit that was just settled, which they'll appeal it, but $254 million because Vioxx. And then Celebrex is a COX-2 inhibitor, and so is the fats I'm going to talk about in a second are COX-2 inhibitors. So I can tell you how to do that cheaper and much healthier than doing it through the medication. And heart disease, immune system, percent body fat, these are all benefits by eating good fats. All right, so what are good fats? Well, first thing I'm going to talk about is bad fats. When I worked at Frito-Lay, 
We used to sell Doritos, Munchos, Funyuns. We had a four to five week shelf life. Put them out, bring them back, and then we would deliver these soft cookies, and the soft cookies would have a three year shelf life. We'd wheel them out, dust them off occasionally, bring them back three years later. And then they would get in the warehouse, and as the drivers, we'd walk around loading up, and they'd be sitting there, and they were open, and they still would be soft. And at the time, I really don't know, I don't, how could they stay soft? I don't get it. It's because they add this thing called trans fats to it. You take a corn oil, you never, nobody ever in this room ever wants to consume corn oil. It's one of the worst things you can put in the human body. At the time, we didn't know this. Polyunsaturated fat thought, thought to be healthy. When you heat this up and add a metal catalyst to it, it preserves the shelf life forever. Forever. That means the human body can't break it down. That means it gums up the cell. Gums up the cell. So, some of these products, such as Jif peanut butter, this has been in my garage for over nine years, hasn't changed. It won't change. So you're thinking, well, I like Jif peanut butter, and I thought peanut butter was healthy for you. It is in the natural form, not with trans fat. So anytime you see the word partially hydrogenated oils, that means it's a trans fat. That's your only indication. You're trying to get these out of your diet. Jif peanut butter, microwave popcorn, wheat thins, Coffee mate, oh wow. <laughs> but remember, I always have alternatives. I have a hazelnut and a French vanilla creamers up here. Very healthy for you. Not my microwave popcorn I can get that, that's that very healthy. This is what jazzes me up. I get all goofed up about this. This says right on it, trans fat free, it's margarine. When you go to Myers, they have a, they have a a margarine section probably here to the table about this high. Somebody's eating this. I was in Myers yesterday in Okemos. I mean, it's a circus with all the kids coming back. This says trans fat free. The first ingredient is partially hydrogenated soybean oil because they manipulate the serving size. They tease you. They go, okay. If it has this on the label, you probably know it's not healthy for you. If I pulled out this extra virgin olive oil, everybody in this room probably understands that this doesn't have trans fats. They don't have to tell you it doesn't, okay? And then this one really drives me crazy. This is called Benicol Spread, proven to help reduce cholesterol levels. First ingredient, partially hydrogenated soybean oil. We've got to wake up. A better choice, I have this thing called Earth Balance. Many times you see it in the grocery store called Smart Balance. Better choice. Margarine is always a worse choice than butter. Butter is a much better choice. Okay? So keep in mind, if you like butter, have butter is much healthier for you. How many have seen the supersized DVD? Anybody seen that? If, if you're having a bad day in school, your kids are not, you know, they're not into it, rent this thing. Wake them up. This guy goes to McDonald's for 30 days, has to eat basically everything on the menu three times a day at McDonald's. Okay? I'm watching it, his enzyme levels go off, he doesn't know if he's going to make it, blah, blah. But what's the most fascinating part to me, at the end, they had the extras, and they show the breakdown of a fish sandwich, a chicken sandwich, a Big Mac, and French fries. Anybody seen that part of it? They put it in a little terrarium, all moist. And you're thinking, well, two days later, fish sandwich, chicken sandwich start to break down, start to mold. You're going, it should. Well, how come the Big Mac doesn't mo start to mold for five days? I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't want a Big Mac anymore. And then I look at the French fries, and I go, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks later, no breakdown in the French fries. So I started thinking back when I was at Sexton High School back in the mid 70s. We go to McDonald's for lunch. French fries would fall in the bucket seats of the car. The spring we'd clean the car. We'd see the French fry. Pull the French fry out, wipe it off, and you eat it. <laughs> Make sure nobody's looking, but you would, right? I've done it. And I think, oh my gosh, what happened to those french fries? They're somewhere in my body, somewhere. They haven't broken down yet. <laughs> now, are we going to have a french fry again? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'll never have a McDonald's french fry. I might go to, you know, Johnny Rockets or something, get something else I don't know, but I'm not having a McDonald's french fry. And another thing I'll never eat in my life again will be a McDonald's milkshake. Two and a half pages of ingredients. None of those are dairy. So if you want to go get a milkshake, go to Burger King, okay? Just don't worry about the McDonald thing. The point of this is, remember the cell? It makes the cell rock hard. How many diabetics out there, type 2 diabetics? They have problems. The first thing you do is take the trans fats out. The cell heals itself. True story. I, have, I can't tell you one after another. 
take the trans fats out. I'm not telling you to have this stuff. I'm just having better choices. If you say, you know what, I like coffee, mate, and I like Jif peanut butter, maybe you cut one of those out. That's where you start. Okay? But to me, once you start, how many, how many natural peanut butter users in here? When you go back to Jif peanut butter, you won't like it. And the people that like Jif peanut butter won't like the natural. So it's a transitional period. That's all. Just want to sh sh share that with you. But keep that in mind. Keep that thought process that if every trans fat that I consume in my body, it won't break down. And that's why they use them, because they don't break down. Now you're thinking, gosh, you know, I really like to eat french fries occasionally. Well, don't worry about it if it's occasionally. It's the regularity that's causing the problem. Saturated fats are much healthier. A great cooking oil, some of you are into it or not, is coconut oil. High heats, get it at the health food store, very good tasting. If you have any left over, you can put it on your skin. It's actually a good skin <laughs> thing. Now, when we talk about the, the last part of this fat thing, I'm going to tell you what you need to do right now. This is in your handout, but just pay attention just for a second. This is real simple. Two servings of monounsaturated fats every day. Just two servings. What does that mean? That means two tablespoons a day. It could be a tablespoon of natural peanut butter. It could be some almonds. It could be extra virgin olive oil on a salad. That's all you need. There's a new medication coming out right now that has this thing called nitric oxide. Everybody's heard of nitroglycerin before. You have a heart attack, they give you nitroglycerin, it makes the vessels relax. That's what nitric oxide does. It's in extra virgin olive oil. It helps to relax your vessels. So if you have blood pressure issues, you can kind of see how that might help that over time. Two tablespoons every day right here, okay? I put almonds on my cereal, I use extra virgin olive oil in my salad, I'm done for the day. That's all I need. And this is going to be scary for some of you right here. This is the best kept secret right here. This is the missing link. These omega-3 fats, that's the only thing I want you to pay attention to right now. The omega-3 fats, everybody heard of essential fatty acids? Nobody? Okay. That means they're essential for the human body. 96% of the United States population is deficient in omega-3 fats. That means 4%. Are you that 4%? We even put this in a health history question for personal training at the MAC, what kind of essential fats do you consume? Nine out of 10 times a question mark in that. We don't know. Well, how would you know? Nobody talks about it. So when you talk about omega-3 fats, the highest source of omega-3 from a vegetable standpoint is this thing called flax seeds. You have to buy these at the health food store. They're so inexpensive. If you have kids, talk to your students, this is a no-brainer. My son, Matt, I told him it would improve his golf focus. Patella tendon, playing basketball a couple years ago, big scar, my patella went up in my quad, my son's thinking I have a cramp and I basically lost my knee, put two screws in here. The worst thing though about the whole ordeal was, the doctor says you're going to be on a femoral block for three days and then it's going to be really painful. Three days, it was painful, but it wasn't because of the, Vi it was because of the Vicodin caused constipation. I don't know about you, I've never been constipated in my life. Four days with no bowel movement, I was in serious problems. And then I thought, you know, gosh, I'm cramping up. I'm having, I thought, you know what? I got to go to my nature source right here. Two tablespoons in the morning, two tablespoons at lunch, lickety split. Boom, perfect. <laughs> What'd you learn today? Well, I learned that I better not have too much of this because it can cause some problems. This is loaded with omega-3s in there. From brain development, we're seeing this right now. They're actually adding omega-3s to infant formula. We need to get in our diet because with the foods we consume now do not have omega-3s in them. You can do the flaxseed oil, which is much more expensive. You can do the flaxseed oil capsules. I would recommend this, very inexpensive, high in fiber, very good for you, one tablespoon per day. Very easy. The other thing I'm just going to mention from a time standpoint, we didn't have a lot of time to talk about this, is cod liver oil. The reason I'm saying cod liver oil, make sure you get the lemon flavor. Do not buy regular cod liver oil. One teaspoon is all you need a day. So I'm making this really simple. Two tablespoons of the monounsaturated fats every day, one tablespoon of the flax, one teaspoon of this. And you're thinking, well, you know what? You went overboard now. Maybe I'll just do natural peanut butter and leave it at that. Then maybe down the road you decide to do the flax, maybe the fish. If you have arthritis, you got to do the fish oil. If you have heart disease, high cholesterol, inflammation issues, this will help it right away. One teaspoon of that. Because the quality of the fish now is not the same as it used to be. 
true story. I'm at a, my brother-in-law, my, my wife's Lebanese. We're at a, they have functions every, like, freaking week. We're at another birthday party. And he says to me, he has high cholesterol levels. So we talked about this a while back, and he says, you know what? I can't believe it. My cholesterol levels dropped. Unbelievable. I'm going, well, you know, I told you this a long time ago, but now you're starting to believe it. Well, now it did. He did believe it. But he says, I'm really having a hard time with the cod liver oil. And I said, what's the problem? He goes, it just tastes bad. I go, it just tastes like a lemon drop. He goes, mine doesn't. So I go in the refrigerator. He's got the regular cod liver oil. I said, well, how do you consume it? He said, I put it in my cereal. <laughs> I said, so how long have you been doing this? Three months. So three, every day you take the cod liver oil and put it on your cereal, and it tastes, I mean, just open it up, it smells so bad. You don't have to do this. This is lemon flavor, so make sure you buy the lemon flavor, okay? Yes? The cod liver oil? I put mine in my oatmeal. You put it in a salad, you put it in a smoothie. I wouldn't recommend taking it straight. You need to have it with the food. My kids take it straight, but, you know, that's... You can take the flax, you can mix it with, let's say, juice, or you can put it in food. So, but it's best in, like, uh, yogurt or cottage cheese or cereal, things like that. Yes? You can take it. I, the, the question is, take an omega-3s in a capsule. You can do that. The problem is you have to have about four or five capsules to equal one of the tablespoons or teaspoons. So you can do that. I have cod liver oil right here. So if you're having a problem with that, this is it right here. So just keep in mind, you're going to go, oh my gosh, this is kind of expensive. This is 10 bucks, and this will last me about a month and a half. Remember, Lipitor is $115 a month. Okay? Yes? You don't want to bake it, actually. So you can add it after your granola is done. Yep, good question. Okay? Now I'll take some questions in a second. I just kind of want to get through some of the stuff here. All right, so we're kind of wrapping it up here, and then we're going to ask some questions here. Think about a couple things we're doing today. One is experimenting with foods. And when I was in college, I was at Western Michigan back in the, like I said, late 70s. You know, my breakfast is horrible. Life cereal, I was doing myself, a, I was doing like 2% milk, white bread. And remember, hillbilly bread is not whole wheat bread. And I was doing that, margarine, the whole deal, you know, Miracle Whip for lunch, bologna sandwiches, how many, that dates me. Anybody having bologna sandwiches now? I hope you're not. So all those things, it's been a transition along the way. So when you leave here today, I want you to think about that. Eating a couple times, three times a day, or th every three hours if you can. Just making some changes with your, with your fats and your proteins and your carbs. And when you're traveling, are you really preparing yourself to travel? True story. I went to San Francisco. This will really kind of give you an idea how goofy I am. I pack some red peppers. I stuff them with tuna, carbohydrates. Tuna is a protein. Put a little olive oil in there and a couple nuts, a few raisins, and I put it in a little baggie. So I don't care about taking my laptop with me. I'm taking my food. Everybody knows that when I travel, I always take my food with me. You won't ever see me come to the Mac without my food because it's really important for me to feel good. So I took these on the airplane. I'm sitting in the bulkhead. Right in the center, and about two hours into the flight, I'm coming back from San Francisco, and we all know you have to go through the security. Then you get on the plane. I'm talking, I haven't eaten in five, six hours. And I open these things up. Can you imagine opening a tuna on a plane? And half the people are drinking beer and eating nuts, and that's about it. That's all they're consuming. And at first, the guy next to me is going, God, that smells bad. But then he starts to get hungry and goes, can I have one? I have about five of them. I said, sure, if I could have sold, I could have sold these for 20 bucks each. <laughs> and then I get out in, the, in the, the terminal area, and everybody from the Mac's in the back, and they're going, what the heck are you talking about now? People are in the lobby asking me about this stuff. The point of this is when you're traveling, you don't need to be held captive, because when they dump you out into the end of the terminal, what do you got? Cinnabon, Burger King, you name it, you haven't eaten in five hours. What are you going to do when you get out? You're going to eat something. And that's the stuff that kills us each and every day. It's all these small little changes. Now, you don't have to go to this extreme. This is kind of extreme, okay? But you don't have to go that extreme. But those are the ma major changes that s help over time. It's all these little bitty things. Like I said at the very beginning, it's my son. Somebody in this audience was really planting a couple seeds. 
and now that he's in college, he's paying attention. He's understanding that he's not going to be in the pro golf tour. He needs to do something differently in his life. And then when you talk about recipes that are easy, in my book I have 82 recipes. I plagiarize most every one of them. I just change the quality of the ingredients in many recipes. Play with that as much as you can. If you've never baked vegetables before, they're awesome. I bake yams, slice them thinly, put some extra virgin olive oil, broccoli, asparagus, you name it, 350 degrees for 30 to 35 minutes, comes out baked vegetables. I've never liked steamed vegetables before. When I was growing up, I thought pizza only had pepperoni on it. I mean, I didn't know that anything, I didn't know you could get a pizza besides DeMarco's at the time, and I didn't know you couldn't get anything with pepperoni. That's because you don't understand it, you don't know it, you haven't experimented with it. And then I'm going to finish up here with a little bit of exercise. And we talk about exercise here. How many believe it's the fountain of youth? Well, you know, whether you believe it or not, it is. I'm going to tell you, it is. Okay? I mean, if you've never met Jack LaLanne, and I have, and I had coffee with him and a couple other guys, and that told me right there, you know what, this is the fountain of youth. This guy's nine years old, and I'm afraid of him. I mean, he's, he's standing up, his posture's there, and, you know, he says he's never eaten a Snickers bar in his life. I think he's kind of lost something there. He needs to eat a Snickers bar occasionally, but he doesn't. But this is the fountain of youth here. The thing I tell everybody about this right here is a return on investment. You don't need to be Jack Lane. You don't need to be a fitness queen, king, whatever. You need to do, move the body regularly. We're meant to move. We're not meant to be sedentary. So as simple as doing a five-minute walk out and a five-minute walk back is going to help you. How many, well, I used to say how many. When I go to different clubs, every club in the United States has this thing called, what, what's this called? What's that called? Come on, ladies, you know what it is. It's called a butt blaster. Okay? Some clubs have two or three of them. So when you're going for a walk, return on investment, when you walk, why couldn't you make the walk a butt blaster? How many of you, pull your, let me give you your posture right now. Come on, let's see it again. Come on. You can sit down, you can sit down. But I want you to do your posture in your chair. So why don't you scoot your butt. Oh, go ahead and stand up. Oh, down, no, I'm just teasing. So when you're standing, when you're standing, here I am at Myers a couple months back with my daughter. She goes, Dad, what are you doing? I go, Kristen, I'm working on my posture. And as usual, she says, you're such an idiot. Just leave me alone. <laughs> but if I'm standing right now, the navel pulled up and in, and the butt tight is your break for your back. When you put a weight belt, anybody seen the weight belts in here? I used to be one of those guys. When you pull a weight belt around the waist, you are artificially stimulating the transverse abdominis muscles. If you squeeze the butt and pull the navel up and in, it stabilizes the back. So when you're working, you're standing throughout the day, engage your legs. Right now, if everybody's squeezing their butt as hard as they can, pull the navel up and in, how long can you sustain that? Not very long. Now when you go for a five-minute walk, instead of just kind of leisurely walking, which you can, really squeeze your butt, now you're doing a butt blaster. Now as you move a little tighter and you're flexing your arms, you can kind of see you're getting a better return on your investment. If you're sitting at, and your kids are at this, in, in their chairs, get them up there and say, you know what? One of the things I see every day is poor posture. They come to see me. You guys come to see me, and you all send you next thing you know, I have migraine headaches. Why would you have migraine headaches? I can't figure it out. <laughs> the head weighs eight pounds. If the head gets forward, the neck muscles get all state, you know, then you're in trouble. Okay, you can have a seat for a second. I'll get you back up in one more second. Or here's the guy walking into my office. Hi, Mr. Jones. You're here to, for your back? How'd you know I had a back problem? <laughs> How did I know? Because if the human body is lined up symmetrically, it will start to heal itself. It's true. I've seen it over and over and over. So you can really help your students and yourself if you start paying attention to your posture a little bit. If you elevate the ribcage, pull this in, you are strength training right now. It's that simple. You don't need to kill yourself from an exercise standpoint. Everybody's trying to do this all the time. You don't have to. You can enhance your posture right away, and then this, this will start to drastically change. And then you go out for a little five-minute walk, 10-minute walk, get your kids up moving around, work on your posture, you can do this in your classroom. We know right now, brain gym. Everybody know, familiar with brain gym? Math, math teachers, 
the question is, is it a negative or a plus? Negatives move to the left. So now we're going to walk to the left and walk to the right. And you do this right now, and then it washes their brain. People say, Chris, how come you exercise every day? Because it washes my brain. It gets all the crap out of it. Okay? It's not because, you know, and you want to look good and all that kind of stuff, but more than anything else, it makes my brain feel good. It makes me feel good. That's the return on investment. The reason people don't exercise, I think, is because they don't have enough time and they don't know what to do. And you can say they're lazy and all that stuff, but if I can tell you five minutes out, five minutes back, work on your posture, you're going to get return on investment, you might want to go to the next level. And I can't tell you how many infomercials you see. Only three minutes, two ice a week. You look just like me. I mean, it's crap, right? Is that true? I'm going, I'm almost thinking, man, that maybe I need to get that machine because these people look really good. No, it doesn't work. They've only been dieting for about three months, and they're doing this and this and this. This is what I see every day. Just walk, okay? Here's my mom. Bionic woman, ankle fusion, knee replacement, both hips replaced in four years. What is she doing? She's squatting. Everybody in this room needs to understand how to do a squat correctly, okay? You take your feet, we lined them up together. Stick your rear end out, pull your elbows back, and right now, what do you see right here? The big butt, right? The butt is the break for the back. If you don't believe me, if you ever go to Italy, public restrooms, there's no toilet seats. You have to learn how to squat in Italy. <laughs> and people say all the time, I got a knee problem and a hip problem. She, you can see her. I had to teach her how to squat correctly. Because most people, when they squat, they go to the knees first. Their knees hurt them. You need to learn how to use the muscles correctly. It could be as simple as a straight-legged yoga lunge. I'm strength training right now. And you could advance it into a warrior movement or even into some balance poses. The point of this is you don't need to spend a lot of time and energy to doing this. You guys got a beautiful facility here. Many of the stuff you can do at home with no equipment at all. Educate yourselves, your students, this is easy to do. My mom's completely changed your life. And she was one of those people who said, oh, that exercise, I don't, you wait till you're my age. You know, I, I hurt too much. Well, I hired a trainer, got her lined up, and the next thing you know, she's religious about her exercise. She doesn't go crazy, she just works a handful of different movements, and now that's why I call her bionic woman. And then exercise and weight loss. We're wrapping it up right here. This is another thing I think with exercise. We have time limits at the MAC, 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise or more. We have people fighting on machines. I was here first, you know, I was here first, and you know, then we have to come break it up. The point is they don't understand it because exercise is an important component. As we age, we lose this thing called muscle. I have seven pounds of muscle and five pounds of fat, basically. We want to hold on to muscle as we age. A little bit of exercise regularly holds on to that muscle. That's that simple. You don't need to stimulate the muscle a great deal to hold on to it. You only need to really stimulate about 20 to 25% of its maximum capacity, and it will sustain itself. It's that simple. And here's me. I was eating a little bit more in the red area for a little while. I compete in physique shows in the spring over age 40, and I thought, you know what? If I gain a little bit more weight, and I do this all naturally, I've never taken a drug in my life, and I thought, you know, I'm going to get a little bigger, a little more muscle. All I did is get a little bit heavier, okay? 217 pounds. And people say, well, what's, what's the point of this whole thing? You know, some of you are going, what's the point? I don't see your white belly anymore. This is me 12 weeks later. People say, well, what did you do differently? I did nothing different from this slide to this slide. In fact, I was doing this seminar last week at KVCC, and people were laughing in the audience. They didn't think that was me. My wife is in the audience. She goes, yeah, that's him. And I tell people all the time, this slide right here, I look like this for about three hours. <laughs> and then I'm somewhere in between. But the point of this is you don't need to kill yourself to lose weight. And that's why I see people all the time. The more I spend on the treadmill, the more I am to walk, the more your posture gets out of alignment. You're better off doing less in higher quality. Nutrition. Don't worry about quantity. We talked about that. How many oranges or apples would you eat? The higher quality that you get, the less you'll overconsume. If you're eating good fats, good proteins, and good carbs, you're going to have less chances of overeating. Now, if I gave everybody in this room those foods, if I gave everybody in this room an organic chicken breast, a baked yam, and some asparagus, and many of you are going, I don't want any of that. But if you had that, you're probably not going to overeat later in the evening. And that's the point, where some of the stuff we're talking about. So just keep that in mind, 
The exercise is part of the component, it's not the complete answer. So if you're looking at an exercise program right here, you got a warm up phase, you got a cardio, strength training, and stretching. You're saying, okay, I don't really do any of this stuff, I'm just starting, five minutes out, five minutes walks. Work on your posture, that's where you start. If you want to get some bands and stuff for your house, remember, cardiovascular exercise, you don't really need to do more than 20 minutes unless you're competing for a marathon triathlon, things like that. Okay. All right, I'm going to take some questions, and i got one more thing, and we'll, we're, I'll let you go. Questions? Anybody got anything? Nothing at all? Yes. Don't cook with a flax seed. Now the seeds themselves, the question is cooking with the flax seeds. You can cook with the seeds, it's just a fiber source. But once you grind the seeds and open them up, that's where you get the omega-3s, then you want to serve them cold. Those are fine. The seeds themselves are very, very, you can do, the seeds won't do anything, you won't damage the seeds at all. But you don't get the benefits of the omega-3s until you open up the seed and you have to grind those with a coffee grinder. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. I think they're fantastic. You know, I work at the Michigan Athletic Club. I don't care where people exercise. The whole mission is, is the human body, we want to move. If curves gets people off the couch and into doing something, you, one thing leads to another. We know right now in the MAC, we know curves is a great thing because eventually over time, many, some of those folks might want to maybe take it to, maybe to the next level. And if they don't want to take the next level, that's great. And you don't even need to join curves or anything else. You just need to move the body. It's that simple. If you can maintain your posture, which we talked about right now, and all the things, that's going to benefit for you. But I think curves and women's only gyms and things like that are fantastic. Yes. Well, when you get into natural, natural really can hurt in a certain things. So you got to look at the ingredients and really, when you talk about even organic, you know, is it really truly organic? So you got to have some faith in some of that stuff. And when it's, you hear the word natural, that doesn't really tell you a lot. But from a soy standpoint, you really don't want to have a lot of ingredients. It should say isolated soy or pure soy. You don't want any GMO, just genetically modified, anything like that. So it will tell you there. But if I'm get consuming soy, most of the time I'm going to go to the health food store and purchase my soy products. Yes? You don't lose that much. In fact, I think the body needs the recovery time. You know, I went up to Cross Village for vacation, and it's so funny. My son, I, have a, I, have a, I ate a big Klondike bar, bought a Klondike bar. He put it on my screensaver at work. <laughs> the point of it is, in vacations, you're on vacation. You don't need to kill yourself. But t to me, it's a perfect time for me to really relax and do some different things. And so I still do yoga poses every day and things like that. It's part of making me feel good, but I don't go to the gym when I'm on vacation or things like that. You won't lose much at all. Yes? Well, the ground flax seeds will last you about anywhere between a month, a month and a half after you grind it. I wouldn't recommend buying it already ground. It's more expensive and it's not as good for you. But it will last quite a while on your refrigerator. So, yes, way in the back. Yeah, olive oil you want to cook at lower temperatures. You want to get extra virgin olive oil because it's the first press. And your cooking oils at higher temperature are going to be Expel the pressed canola oil, I got almond oil, things like that. That's all in your handout too. But the olive oil will be lower temperatures, which is like 350 or less. Okay? Yes? Well, we didn't have too much time to talk about that, but I would just highly recommend we're not doing equal. Everybody knows we shouldn't be using artificial sweeteners. Okay? Splenda is an okay choice. A better choice is a thing called stevia, which you get at the health food store. And the price is almost identical to Splenda. Tastes just a little different. It's made from a stevia plant. And one last thing before I forget, we, I don't really need to talk about water, but I was 
at a seminar about two months ago, and I had a, gr a kindergarten school teacher, and she raised her hand, and she says, you know, one of the things I want to tell you, I was at your seminar a couple years back, and I have now my kindergartners drinking more water. Do you think that's going to impact those kids as they get older? Absolutely. These are little tiny changes you make that make huge changes. I wouldn't recommend any Gatorade, Mountain Dew, uh, Powerade drinks. If the kids want some electrolytes, get smart water and things like that, okay? Because of the high fructose corn syrup you don't want from those products. But that's what I would recommend from a sweetener standpoint. The big challenge with phosphates or with colas is because the phosphates leach out bone. And if you think you're taking decaf coffee and it's a better choice than regular coffee, you're dreaming because the formaldehyde in decaffeinated coffee is worse for you than the caffeine. So it's better off to have a really a healthier coffee and then maybe move into a tea or balance that out. Okay? Boy, I'm really bursting some bubbles, aren't I? <laughs> yes. Flavored water. This, this one does have the smart water. This, has, this is strawberry banana. It has a little flavor. This is my... This is my cocktail every night. I get Perrier mineral water. Ladies, this is one of the best things you can do for increasing your pH and your bone health. I love the carbonation, and I drink that basically every night. Lime flavor. Yet, and one more question? No? Okay. Yes? Yeah, they have formaldehyde because that's what they do. They, they separate it. There's a great book called What Einstein Doesn't Tell You About Foods. You know, I'm kind of weird. This is what I do for a living. But that's what it does, and they, that's the process. So you're really substituting, substituting one chemical for the other, and the ca caffeine is probably even better for you than formaldehyde. Tea as well, yeah. You're better off. Tea is always going to be a better choice than coffee. So if you like moving in that direction, there's a whole parameter you can go move down the line. But keep doing your coffee in moderation, the tea, whatever, even if it's decaffeinated. I'm not trying to do that. But one thing you could do is change your sweetener or your creamer. Two more questions. Yes. Well, one of the problems, the question is how many almonds a day? Almonds, like any other fat, are very high in calories. So, true story, I had a couple guys last year saying, you know what, I'm, I'm gaining weight doing your program. And I said, well, tell me about it. And they said, well, we're eating almonds and walnuts. Well, how much? Well, about a cup to a cup and a half a day. I go, no, it's one tablespoon. So. One of the things I do from almond standpoint is I buy them slivered because I don't overeat them. So one to two tablespoons of almonds and I put on my cereal and I don't overeat them. Okay. One last question, yes. You're just doing the Quaker old fashioned oats? Perfect, perfect. You don't ever have to have instant again because you can microwave and put it on a stove or you can eat it cold like we did earlier. Then let's say I, I went to Foods for a Living Health Food Store in Grand River Park Lake. It has organic oatmeal. It's just a little heartier, that's all. A little higher in protein. Tastes just a little different. Basically the same. So, And the steel cut oats, if you've never had them, are going to be a lot more hearty. So, Yes? Salt? Well, really the human body, the thing is like the RDA will tell you, about 3,000 milligrams a day is really... But if you eat really whole foods, you never have to worry about salt, okay? Like, for example, chicken noodle soup, Campbell's chicken noodle soup, 1,000 milligrams right here in one can of soup. Versus you can get soup here that has basically 200 milligrams of sodium. So the point is, is if you're eating more of these fruits and vegetables and real foods, you're never going to have to worry about salt, okay? All right. I'm getting the eye. i got to go. All right, last thing I want to mention to you. You run into, you know Bob. Bob's a good friend of yours, but you haven't seen Bob in about three years. And Bob kind of gained a lot of weight. And when you see Bob, Bob has lost about 50 pounds. So what do you guys say to Bob? Bob, you look great. Right? Everybody said that. Then what's your next question? How did you do it? Right? Is that really the question you need to ask? No. The question becomes, when did you decide to do it? So each and every day I do this.